Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Venable and our program today entitled Enhancing the Nonprofit Governance Model, Legal Pitfalls, and Best Practices. My name is Jeff Tenenbaum, Chair of the Nonprofit Organizations Practice here at the Venable Law Firm. And this is part of the monthly series of programs, luncheon programs, and webinars that we do on a wide variety of nonprofit legal topics. Uh, we have a great room here of about, uh, I don't know, 85 people or so in our Washington, D.C. office uh, joining us for lunch on our program here today. And we have about 250 people uh, signed up and registered and participating online today across the country. So clearly a hot topic, uh, either because of our speakers or our topic or something else, clearly not involving me. Uh, but we are uh, pleased that you're all uh, participating and joining us for our program here today. We think it's going to be a great one. Uh, this is one of those topics uh, that a lot of times people ask me, um, kind of what are the, 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 the new developments and the new hot topics in the nonprofit legal world? Um, and, and once in a while, there are new developments in the nonprofit kind of governance area. Uh, you know, within the last year, we saw New York uh, overhaul their nonprofit um, uh, corporate statute. D.C. did the same a few years ago. Uh, there are sometimes changes uh, in the laws, which are new developments in this area. But frankly, and more frequently, the important topics in, the, in this area are not hot topics, they're not new developments, but they're things that every nonprofit has to deal with all the time, sometimes in a very difficult manner. Governance issues can be some of the most vexing issues uh, that face nonprofit organizations. They certainly have legal implications, uh, but they have many non-legal implications as well. It's one of those areas where the legal and the non-legal aspects are very much intertwined um, and we're going to discuss a lot of that here today, and that's one of the reasons why, as you know, for, for these monthly programs, uh, we always have some venerable attorneys speaking, but we like to bring in uh, outside folks uh, to help supplement our panels, and in today's uh, addition uh, to the panel, which I hope I'll introduce in a, in a minute, is, is going to be a great addition in that respect. Uh, a few housekeeping things first. Uh, first, for those of you who are uh, certified association executives uh, from ASAE, uh, these, these programs are eligible for CAE continuing education credit. Uh, preview of our upcoming programs. We have three on the books uh, so far. Uh, in, on December 11th, our program here is entitled LGBT, Religion and Diversity in the Nonprofit Workplace. On January 7th, uh, and by the way, that's a, a, date, a, a date change from the previous date that we had scheduled. We had to move that January 7th. Uh, our program is entitled Cross-Border Money Transfers, Key Requirements Every U.S.-Based Nonprofit Needs to Know. Um, and then on February 18th, our program is entitled One Year Later, Time for Nonprofits to Implement the Super Circular. Uh, so for all of you nonprofits who are federal award recipients, grants, cooperative agreements, contracts, uh, this is a program you are not going to want to miss. This is an area that's been keeping us very, very busy here at Venable, and I'm sure many of you are federal award recipients, uh, the same uh, for, for your organizations. A few uh, uh, logistical matters. First off, in terms of questions, today's program really lends itself to taking questions throughout the program. So we encourage you to ask questions throughout the program. Uh, just keep in mind that for the benefit of those on the webinar, wait and uh, raise your hand when you want to ask a question, uh, and Marion and her others in the back of the room will have a handheld mic that they'll come to you uh, to pose your question. Uh, and, and please do be understanding if I need to cut questions off at certain times to make sure that we can get through uh, the presentation uh, and finish up by 2 o'clock Eastern time. For those of you on the phone, please pose your questions using the chat feature on the webcast software, and I'll be manning that and posing questions to our speakers uh, at the appropriate time. As you're going to see, this is going to be a very interactive presentation. Uh, not a lot of prepared remarks, but a lot of kind of going back and forth and examples and war stories and pitfalls and things like that that I think you're going to find uh, very interesting. Uh, for those of you here in the room, you have a handout booklet in front of you that has a copy of the PowerPoint slides along with some related articles on the, on the topic that we've written in the past. Uh, those of you on the phone should have gotten as part of the uh, confirmation email a link to the PowerPoint presentation. Tomorrow everyone will get an email that has all of those materials plus a link to the recording of today's uh, webinar. And as many of you know, all of the recordings of our monthly nonprofit webinars going back about three and a half years are available on our nonprofit YouTube channel. And the link to that is at, on the last slide of today's uh, PowerPoint presentation. Now, let me introduce our speakers for you. Uh, first, to my, um, uh, to my far right is George Constantine. Uh, George uh, is someone with whom I've worked for uh, most of my uh, 15 years that I've been at Venable. I think I've worked with George for 13 or 
14 of those 13. Um, he and I have worked very closely together um, in, in managing the, the, the nonprofit practice here. Uh, we've had a lot of fun together over those last 13 years. Uh, I have incredible respect for George. He's a phenomenal lawyer, as many of you know, including Mike, who, who, who works frequently with George. Uh, he's also co-chair of the firm's regulatory practice group um, and has been a, a key leader uh, in Venable and in our nonprofit practice in particular. Uh, to, uh, to, to my immediate right is Mike Curtin. Uh, Mike is CEO of DC Central Kitchen, uh, a nationally recognized community kitchen that recycles food from around Washington, DC and uses it as a tool to train unemployed adults to develop work skills while providing thousands of meals for local service agencies in the process. Uh, drawing on his experiences as an entrepreneur in the restaurant business, uh, Mike has spent significant time in the kitchen's revenue generating social enterprise initiatives. Under his leadership, DC Central's Kitchen Fresh Start Catering has expanded from traditional catering opportunity to include contracts to provide locally sourced scratch cooked meals to schools in DC. Uh, since 2010, DC Central Kitchen has generated over $20 million from these businesses and social enterprise now accounts for roughly 65% of the kitchen's total operating budget. Um, Mike is a terrific leader uh, of a uh, very uh, well-regarded, highly regarded nonprofit organization. He's also a very sharp guy, a very smart guy, and a very good guy, someone with whom we've had the privilege to work uh, for a number of years. He's a great friend of Venables and has terrific insights into nonprofit governance issues, having dealt with many governance challenges himself over the years um, in his current capacity. So uh, you're going to have the benefit of Mike's insights here today. And with that, I'll turn it over to George to get us started. George. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Good afternoon, everyone, and afternoon, everyone on the phone as well. Um, so uh, yeah, as Jeff alluded to, we're, we're not going to have a lot of uh, uh, sort of prepared uh, remarks here. We really want to go into some some points and scenarios and, and war stories, uh, uh, you know, regarding um, you know effectively managing a relationship between staff and your board uh, and doing it in a way that, that advances the organization uh, and, and in a way is obviously you know legally compliant. Um, I'm going to start out and talk a little bit about it, some of those legal issues. I think it's good to have that legal frame, that 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 background, that that um, sort of you know helps sort of support why we're we're talking about this and where the where the lines are on the on the legal front. Um, and then we'll, we'll go over and into our discussion. And, and as Jeff said, we definitely invite you to volunteer um, thoughts, questions, uh, observations, uh, you know, whatever you you feel might might add to the discussion. We we don't want this just to be the the George and Mike show. Um, so with that, um, talk a little bit about some of the basics. And some of this, I apologize, is very basic and things that, that many of you know, but maybe something that's a good reminder for you to have in, in mind. Um, you know, when we're talking about this, we're talking about nonprofit organizations, be it you know tr t traditional 501c3 charitable type organization, or maybe a 501c6 uh, association membership organization, or the like. And just remember, when we're talking about that, you're you're a your corporation, you're a nonprofit corporation, uh, and as, as part of being a nonprofit corporation, your individual directors, your individual members, um, staff have some protection from liability by virtue of having that corporate status. It's a good thing to have. In exchange for having that protection from individual liability, you've got to adhere to the state nonprofit corporation statute and certain other requirements. The nonprofit status that you have as a corporation is different from the tax exempt status. I think nonprofits, the state awards nonprofit status uh, um, for, 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 for corporate status. The, the IRS is, is the federal agency that gives you tax exempt status. And there are requirements under both nonprofit corporation statutes in each state, obviously tax exempt status, 501c3 or 501c6. There are a number of requirements you have to meet in order to have the privilege to have exemption from, from, from tax. Um, another sort of maybe a refresher for most of you um, when it comes to what sort of you know uh, authority binds the organization what things you need to look to there's there's kind of a hierarchy um, a, many organizations and many board members in particular think well I look to the bylaws the bylaws tell me what I need to do well the bylaws are kind of sort of low low rung on the hierarchy first it's it's from a corporate perspective it's the nonprofit corporation law both the statute you know, each state has some type of nonprofit corporation statute that sets forth the lay of the land in terms of 
what's required of, of board members, what's required of the organization, um, you know, what's the minimum size of board members, for instance, what are the default provisions with regard to notice to, of, of meetings, uh, with regard to notice to members, those sorts of things. That's at the highest rung of the, of the ladder from a corporate perspective. And it's not just the statute, but it's also common law. Over the course of many, many years, um, we're going to talk very briefly about fiduciary duties of, of board members. Um, you know, courts have developed a body of law that says this is your individual obligation as a, as a director of a nonprofit organization. Um, under that is the Articles of Incorporation, a very brief document that's filed with the state to get you corporate status. Uh, then come the bylaws, and then finally under that are policies and procedures. And we'll talk a little bit more about the importance of this hierarchy as we go through some of our scenarios and some of our sort of top ten tips that we've listed out as to why these are important and, and when to use which document for which sort of um, uh, goal you're trying to achieve. So just a few things to remember as a staff person or a member of a board. Um, <laughs> Boards of directors are generally only allowed to act and bind a corporation when they act as part of a meeting. Um, if there is no meeting, uh, sort of email polls of board members generally aren't enough to bind the corporation unless it's a unanimous written consent. So if it's something so um, non-controversial that a board can agree to it unanimously, that means every director sends in a consent saying, yes, I agree whether it can be by email, whether it needs to be you know, some other format, depends on the state requirements. Most states are moving towards email, thank God. But, um, but, but remember, the, the general concept here is that boards make decisions uh, um, most effectively and efficiently um, when, they, when they deliberate, when they act as a body. And um, sort of each individual director just casting a ballot in a straw poll isn't the goal or the policy behind having boards and boards of directors. Um, Oftentimes we'll get asked, you know, which state applies when we're looking at our nonprofit corporation law. It's the state in which you're incorporated. Many organizations have moved over the course of years, may have incorporated in one state and, and are now located in another. It's the state of incorporation when we look to these rules in the hierarchy of authority that I, I pointed out earlier. Um, in addition to a hierarchy of authority from, from a statutory and legal standpoint, there's also a governance hierarchy sort of you know, who's at the top of the, of the list on down, the board of directors in every state is, is identified as the body that runs the organization. It's in charge. Um, now, that's, you know, at times a tough pill to swallow uh, and, and, and at times, um, um, you know, oftentimes difficult to convince your, your own board that, that indeed there's a responsibility uh, that they have and an obligation that is at the highest rung. This is where the buck stops. It's the board of directors. Under that is, is an executive committee or other committees of the board. Um, generally, an executive committee is, is a subset of the board formed to act in between members of the board. Many of, if you guys are from some older associations, you probably have large boards and it's the executive committee that really runs the show. But, you know, in the event of a push and shove, which would very seldom happen, the, the board trumps the executive committee. Um, below those committees of the board, those committees that are subsets of the board, you have advisory committees, task forces, these entities that are, uh, that are there to help guide the board, help guide the organization, but have no real power to bind the organization or, or act with the power of the board. Um, staff and officers as individuals um, um, have some authority as delegated to them by the board and, and through the bylaws to um, sign on behalf of the corporation, to take certain action, to hire other staff, and those sorts of things. Um, individual directors, just as directors, have no such authority. And, and I think that's an important takeaway as we go through some of our discussions um, uh, today uh, and as you go back to you know, dealing with your boards, is this, this concept of someone who just happens to be a member of the board that doesn't give that person authority to bind the corporation, to sign on behalf of the corporation, to speak on behalf of the corporation, to dictate to staff what should be done. Um, now, as we'll talk, there's sort of um, uh, certain considerations you want to make before you say, no, you can't tell me to do that. Um, but, but the reality is, is, as an individual director, there's no inherent authority that comes with that. The, the authority goes to the board as a body, and when the board is, is, is acting as a body. Um, and finally, before we move on to um, the, the fun discussion here, um, the, the, um, 
each director, this is, this is old hat for a lot of you, but again, let's keep it in mind for our frame. Um, each director of a nonprofit corporation owes certain duties um, to, to the corporation. This is developed over years and years and years of common law. So it's sort of an exception to the general rule that there's no individual liability exposure if you, if you have a corporate shell around you. Well, as a director, um, you, you do have some exposure to individual liability, and that is if you don't meet these duties, the duty of care, the duty of loyalty, and the duty of obedience. Um, you can be individually liable for the harm that you cause to the corporation by breaching those fiduciary duties, um, which is uh, you know, part of, I would hope, most of your um, interactions with the board, particularly in an orientation setting, you, you may be talking about these are the things you owe, and it's a tough sort of uh, message to deliver because um, I would imagine that every board sort of represented in this room, um, not a single one is, is paid for their service on the board of directors, and, and it's sort of a thanks for coming and volunteering to help, by the way. If you, if you screw up, you pay. Um, now, the, the beauty is that if you breach a uh, fiduciary duty or, or you, you, you act in, in, in a way that exposes you individually to liability, there are things like indemnification, statutory limitations of liability, insurance coverage, et cetera, and hopefully most of you or all of you have, have those sorts of uh, safeguards in place. Um, duty of care is the duty to act as a normally prudent director would in the same or similar circumstances, a very sort of subjective sounding requirement. Um, but, but what it means is, is sort of easier to, to see in practice than to, to discuss in theory. Um, you need to be prepared. You need to ask questions. You need to make decisions based on reasonable amount of research, study, whatever it might be. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how staff can help the board meet this fiduciary duty. It, you know, it doesn't happen often, but th there are lawsuits that, that come about for a director's breach of fiduciary duty of care. In fact, one of the more famous ones involved the, the board of the Sibley Hospital years and years ago here in D.C. Uh, the next one, duty of loyalty. Essentially, that's a duty for, for each director to place the corporation's interest at the highest level of consideration when acting as a director. If there's a competing interest, if you have a family interest, if you have a business interest that competes with or, or causes you not to be able to place the corporation's interest at the top, well, there's obvious common, set, uh, common sense steps that boards, uh, members of boards will take. Um, we, we always recommend that conflict of interest policies be put in place, that disclosures be made on an annual basis. Um, we're all familiar with that. The IRS asked about it on the Form 990. Um, you know, the one thing that I would just sort of reiterate here, um, I think the best thing that staff can do to um, solidify good compliance with, with duty of loyalty and, and um, conflict of interest is um, is to uh, not uh, stigmatize the, the, the issue. Because all of our directors are not paid, because all of our directors come to us with families, with, with jobs, with investments, whatever it might be, invariably there will be conflicts that arise. And, and the, the number one first step whenever there's a conflict that needs to happen is a disclosure. And that's not just that annual form which says this is my job because you never know how it can arise. It also comes up with each individual transaction, each individual discussion at a, at a board meeting. So um, it's very important for staff to work with leaders of the board to um, um, openly discuss and encourage disclosure of conflicts, potential, actual, whatever they may be, so that there isn't some sort of you know, hesitancy on the part of a director thinking that they've done something wrong when it's just happenstance that causes them to be in that position. Finally, the duty of obedience requires directors uh, to adhere to the mission of the organization and take decision, make decisions that are consistent with the mission of the organization as, long, as well as with applicable law, uh, their own, the organization's own bylaws, uh, articles of incorporation, other documents. Uh, so um, when it comes to um, you know, making decisions, I think it's important to remind uh, uh, boards of, of what the mission is of the organization and, you know, have competent uh, counsel or whoever it might be um, available to discuss questions of whether this or that contemplated action will be consistent with applicable law, statu uh, bylaws, articles, et cetera. So those are sort of the, that's sort of our framework for, for the discussion today. A lot of basics, but I think it's important to, to have before uh, getting into the fun part. Um, and what I did, you know, not, not that there's only 10 points, you know, 10 is such an arbitrary number, but, you know, we, we, we tend to use top 10, so we're doing it here. Um, and, and feel free to, uh, you know, add or any additional suggestions that you guys have. So we, we, we thought we'd come up with just sort of, you know, tips on effective uh, uh, boards and, and, and relationships between staff and boards. And, um, 
at this point, I, you know, put, we put, put down num number one on the hit parade, uh, although there's not in any particular orders, uh, manage expectations at the outset. And I, Mike has some good examples of, of just how to do that, and I think a lot of you may do some of the similar things that we're going to talk about here but with sure. that. So what, what, what will probably happen uh, yeah. it, is that uh, as we hit each one of these, I will probably say something like, this one is the most important, or this is uh, vitally important, and, and this, this one is. Uh, and, and it speaks, I think, <laughs> until to, the next one. If, until the next one, right? <laughs> uh, but it, it speaks. Th this is a really good way to set the, the framework. Um, George just, just mentioned when he was talking about the duty of loyalty. So, uh, I think the, the, a common sense solution or a common sense uh, reaction. Or, uh, I'm, I'm fond of saying there's really absolutely nothing common about sense. Uh, if, if there was, it wouldn't be seen as such a virtue. And I think oftentimes. Uh, a lot of that, what we expect to be common sense, seems to be checked at the door when people walk into a board meeting or, or a, board, a board room or a board situation. Uh, and I think part of that is based on this idea that there is an answer to what a board is. Uh, as George, there, are, there are many different nonprofits represented in this room, C3s, C6s, others. Uh, there's, uh, there's a social service kind of nonprofit that I'm involved with. There's education, there's arts, there's health. There's associations. I've also been chair of an association board. I've sat on several other boards. Uh, so a lot of what we'll talk about will, will, will branch out. But the, the, the notion that there is an answer, I think, is what causes a lot of problems within the board structure. Uh, I, I, I also believe, particularly when you're looking at C3 organizations, um, and, I, and I'll speak directly to DC Central Kitchen here, as we've evolved over time, uh, the kitchen is not what it was certainly 25 and almost 26 years ago when it started, and not what it was really six or seven or eight years ago. And as we've moved, your Jeff mentioned the social enterprise work that we've done, we've really evolved to a different place, and the board needs to mirror that evolution. The board needs to grow with the organization and adapt to the organization and play the best role it can to support the organization. And the best way to do that is to continually address these expectations and responsibilities. Uh, and, and very honestly, we did not do that or did not do it well. We've just recently gone through an exercise to get to, to address that issue. Uh, and, and again, with a lot of help from George and his colleagues at Venable, we're, very, we're instrumental in working through that. And we can talk about that a little bit. Actually, I think that Jeff had originally planned this particular seminar for about nine months ago, but George is afraid of what I might say because of <laughs> certain situations that we had about a year ago at the kitchen, uh, and, and we figured this was enough time was passed now that I could uh, reasonably speak uh, without getting myself in trouble, <laughs> even though my counsel's right here. Um, so we, we did develop a, a very clear uh, uh, document uh, that we worked, that we dr the kitchen drafted first, or I drafted first. Uh, and then we worked through our governance committee and then worked through the board, and it was accepted at our last board meeting. So it was a long process, but everyone had the opportunity for input. Uh, but the key to it was that it's, it, it was very clearly, and it started out with what the board can expect from the staff, nine very clear expectations, and what the staff can expect from the board, nine very clear expectations. So it set up what I'd, I'd like to see this board staff relationship as more of a, a partnership and, and a parity agreement. And I think one of the reasons we hadn't done that before is because of the, the, this sort of inherent deference that is often given to boards just by virtue of the fact that they're the board. Uh, and, and that, to me, does not seem a practical way to run an organization uh, to, to, in keeping the, the goals of the organization, the mission as the priority, and understanding that both groups have to be working ultimately towards the mission, uh, achieving the mission, accomplishing the mission of the organization, as opposed to staff, staff getting their way or the board getting their way. And if you have that, that uneven power dynamic from the beginning, you're almost doomed uh, to, to get yourself into problems. Uh, and that's really where and quite honestly, we, we found ourselves, and we'll, we'll get into that later, don't worry, I'm sure. Um, uh, but we had to pull ourselves back and say, okay, look, what, what are we all here for? Why are we here? Uh, and that's what became this document uh, that we narrowed down to five pages, but it now will guide us. And if there's an issue, 
we can very clearly go back and say, this is what it says. This is what everyone is on the board signed up for. You signed this. This is the agreement. It's not what you might think. It's not what the board you were on before or the board of your, your, your child's school or the other association that you were involved with in California. This is what this board does. And you need to be, I guess pun intended, on board with that. And if you're not, then this isn't the right board for you. And there's nothing wrong with that. But this is what we do, and this is how we do it. And you know, I know that we, we just did this, um, but I do think it's important to, to have, have a um, um, sort of regular review, maybe every two or three years to yeah. see what it's like. Because you know, as you cycle through different levels of maturity for organizations, it's funny. If you look at associations, when, when, when trade associations, professional societies first start, the board is very strong because that's the impetus of forming the group. It's the members of the organization that want the industry represented, whatever the reason for formation. And, and staff gradually um, sort of um, um, you know, be, becomes more professional. And, and does the board come along with that as quickly as, as staff becomes more professional? That's always an issue with associations. I think with, with many charities, it's the exact opposite. You have the founder who comes in, who starts an organization because he or she has a passion for the group and is a strong leader or passion for the issue and populates the board with like-minded individuals who find the founder to be a great leader and, and, and sort of tend to be dragged along. But you know, at some point, the board needs to figure out as, this, as the, the organization grows that, that there needs to be more sort of traditional board oversight rather than whatever the founder says goes. So uh, that's why I think, you know, constant revision is, is important. Yes. Yes. So when, when the prospective board members are coming on now and people say, well, what do you expect of the board members? We'll say, this is what we expect. This is our policy. And we do ask them to sign that, uh, just as we would ask staff to acknowledge any other policies that we have as part of their orientation joining the organization. What do you call it? The question is, what do you but call it? The question it? is, what do you call it? Uh, we, we call it uh, board and staff uh, do, uh, guiding pr document of guiding principles. And uh, yeah, they can have any number of names. So you've seen, you know, other, you know, just board expectations, roles and responsibilities, and the like. Um, I think it's important on this point, you know, again, very basic um, um, and, and maybe not so basic, but, but, but something that a lot of us already do is training and orientation in new board members and existing board members alike. Um, I think better attention, from my experience, I deal with a lot of associations, a lot of nonprofit organizations. I work with boards very closely on, on training programs. Some of them, it's just a repeat year after year after year of the exact same PowerPoint, the exact same um, materials, the exact same documents, just as a, the expectations document should be, <clears throat> excuse me, updated regularly. So, so should all of the training. I mean, make it relevant and make it interactive and, and um, you know, don't just sort of do it as a checkbox. And I guess, the, uh, I, I think we could probably just start here and keep going, I think, without getting to any of the other slides. Two but through I, ten. But I, I just want to emphasize the one point is that it, it's, that document needs to be a joint group think effort. It, yeah. it can't be imposed one way or the other, I think, to be ultimately to be effective. Everyone needs to feel that they were part of it and that everyone is signing on together. Uh, and and we're, we're working on that going forward, whether it's in revisions or the, how we modify it, but it's a, it's a group effort, staff and board. Great. Want to move on? Okay, number two, um, establish a partnership with board chair. And, and um, I'll go. This is it. absolutely the most important one. <laughs> Uh, you know, again, in my experience in seeing boards and effective boards in action and perhaps less effective, um, you know, staff board relationships, it, it, it all seems to key off of that relationship between the staff, chief staff leader and the board chair, because as you've been in boardrooms, you know, the board chair <coughs> runs the show. They go through the agenda. They determine when enough discussion has been had. <coughs> they, just, they determine <coughs> either by, excuse me, either by their silence or by their, you know, by their actions that particular discussion is relevant or irrelevant and, you know, should we move on? Um, so, um, you know, it, 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 staff is sort of in most situations that I'm in, it's looked as a resource from the board chair and it's asked, is called upon to speak, but, but, you know, it's, it's always, you know, that, that sort of secondary role. So, it, so I, I, I think this is, this is a really important and uh, delicate and for sometimes difficult dance that has to happen between the, the chief executive and, and the board chair. So I, I think there, there needs to be a perception, uh, at least, that the 
the, the board chair is not simply a, a mouthpiece for or a blank rubber stamp for the chief executive. But at the same time, the board also, I believe, needs to know that the chair absolutely supports the chief executive and, and the staff. And so it, it's a very delicate dynamic. And if you go too far one way or the other, you're going to lose the, – there'll be a suspension of belief in, in, for, uh, with the board on who's really – is my input really valued or is it meaningful or is anyone listening? Uh, so th there absolutely needs to be that challenge, uh, but there also needs to be that support. And I think that comes from as this partnership, and, and it's really based on communication. And there's – Again, a lot of these things tie in together. There are other points about the heads up. Uh, so, uh, and again, I, I should, I probably throughout this will say I or we. Uh, please do not misconstrue that to mean I know or we have all the answers because I think one of the reasons I'm here is because quite clearly we didn't uh, and, and that we've learned a lot of lessons. Uh, but I, I do like to think that we're good at learning lessons and we, we do our best not to make the same mistakes. Uh, so one of the things that, that, that we do now is that I meet monthly with the board chair. Uh, we have a breakfast and we go over everything that's going on and I, I give her a heads up on, on what's happening. Uh, even if it's probably not going to be an issue or even if the board may never, ever address this, but if there's even a slight possibility that something could come up later, I feel that as long as the chair has been made aware of this and I've sort of laid out to her what direction this these what directions this might go in that we're covered that we're, that we're safe and it can be her call then if this is something we do want to address to the full board or if we want to bring it to a committee uh, but but there really needs to be that that open communication and again that's that's trust you know, sometimes you're saying things like you know what i think i i might have made a really big mistake here this this has a chance to go sideways pretty quickly but it's much better to do that than have that come up at a board meeting when the chair is unaware and then you lose that whole support and, and the, the, the relationship can just crumble quickly. And, and I, for, for the associations in the room, I found in particular, I mean, if, you, if, if staff there's, or, or councils in the room and monitoring, for, say your trade association, there's some antitrust risks and things like that. If you don't have the buy-in from the chief elected officer when a discussion goes down the wrong road where you're trying to say, look, you know, this is actually contrary to our antitrust compliance policy, we can't be talking about this in the meeting. If you don't have that relationship where the chair is immediately stepping in saying, you know, you know, Mike knows what he's talking about, let's let's move on, it, it's a very dicey situation. And, and it also can help, um, and we'll talk about a little bit about, you know, the you, you, board members are different. They don't, they're not all uniform in terms of their willingness to participate, they're, you know, whether they're an extrovert or an introvert. I mean, you, you want to work with the board chair to call out the, the introverts and maybe you know, sort of even out the discussion and make sure that all views are heard. And those sorts of things don't happen at the meeting. They happen in the pregame planning. Yes. And, and uh, we, we had a situation where we, uh, one our, we had a chair who uh, there was a perception among some on the board that, that we were – best buddies and we hung out all the times on weekends and he, anything that I said he would go along with. At the same time, I was incredibly frustrated with our board chair because he wasn't listening to me and he wasn't supporting me in the way that I felt that he should be. So we had the, 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 the worst of both worlds, really. <laughs> and, and, it was, and that led to a lot of uh, board um, turmoil. I don't know. Being Inter Irish, I, I refer to it as the troubles. <laughs> but, uh, but, but that perception, again, is very, very important, uh, and it needs to be uh, – there needs to be that very open communication. Say, look, this is what I – when this comes up at this meeting, and I think it will, this is really where the direction I think we need to go. And, Mike, I presume that, uh, based on my experience, it, it, what you're suggesting is even more challenging year by year in that you're staying the same, but your board chair is rotating every year or, or, or every other year. And, and some, some board chairs you're going to really hit it off with and, and, and be on the same page, you know, almost automatically. And others you really have to work because the, the, you may be very different personality-wise. And 
and that can be challenging. Um, one piece of advice that, that, or one kind of piece of insight that I'd gotten uh, years ago, when I was going to law school at night, I was working at the American Society of Association Executives back in the time when a guy named uh, Bill Taylor was president and CEO. Um, I always thought Bill did a terrific job at kind of managing the board and board relations. And one of the pieces of advice he gave me back in back in the day uh, was that he, I mean, he was known as a CEO who was really in charge. I mean, this was a staff-driven organization. That organization really still is staff-driven. But Bill was always very good and told me how important it was to make sure that the board chair can shine. You know, don't try to take the limelight away from the board chair. You may be doing all the work behind the scenes and orchestrating everything, but let the board chair have, you know, his or her uh, time in the spotlight and be able to take credit for things. And I thought that was a great piece of advice. I, I, I would agree completely. And I, I think sometimes you can have a, a really terrific board meeting when the chief executive almost says nothing. And really, I think that's almost a sign of, of an excellently planned and executed meeting, where the, the chair is really leading the meeting. Uh, other, other programmatic issues are being addressed by staff, uh, and there's discussion going back and forth. And if the, the chief executive is there uh, but isn't seen as driving the meeting, even though that may be the reality, uh, that, that can have tremendous results. Absolutely. Okay, want to go to number three? Sure. The most important one? The most important one. <laughs> okay. I wonder how, and this one is important. How soon before the show gets <laughs> old, right? Uh, all right, yeah, so this is, this is the most important from my perspective, actually. Um, I, I, I view um, bylaws in particular, but also policies that, that flow under the bylaws as, um, you know, almost more an art than a science. Now, obviously, from a legal perspective, the bylaws should hit all the points um, that you can possibly hit in a way that leaves flexibility um, and, and doesn't um, sort of unnecessarily box the organization in. Um, you could have, and I've seen, incredibly detailed bylaws that seem to contemplate every possible iteration or, or, or eventuality, and I guarantee you at some point you're still going to hit a hole or a gap where it, it this particular scenario wasn't quite contemplated, or the wording that you thought was precise actually is open to two meanings. Um, so it, because the bylaws and the policies under the bylaws are, are generally the, the most read documents in terms of um, um, you know, what directors are looking for for rules of the road, um, uh, they need to first be understandable and, and, and not overly sort of dense and, and, and long when it comes to, you know, trying to address all these points. Legalistic? Is that the word you're yeah, looking for? Right. Yeah, right. Um, because, seriously, because um, you, you can't address every point in the bylaws to begin with. And the reality is that courts give great deference to a board's own interpretation of its own bylaws. Um, there will be points where there just needs to be a judgment call. You know, uh, when does the, the, you know, how does this term limit provision apply, for instance, or, you know, how, how does, you know, the, 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 the officer succession happen if, if the, one of the ones uh, uh, decides not to proceed through the chairs, these sorts of things. Um, you know, ideally the bylaws are going to tell you the answer right away, but even if not, the board can make the reasonable de decision at that point as to, you know, what is, what is best for the organization. Look, I know, particularly if you've got a membership organization, you're, you're going to have some, uh, these call them red ant members, or, or you know, these members who just live for the, 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 the one thing that you may have done that might be slightly contrary to the bylaws. Um, it's it, it, it's a cost of doing business as an association, as a nonprofit organization. That I, I to, to this day I've experienced so many of these, and I've yet to understand what motivates them. Um, but they're out there, and um, but. Um, it, as long as there's a reasonable interpretation that, that that's not you know any way, you know a, a stretch from the from the from the board, um, you know a court will, will will accept that interpretation. So, I, just when it comes to looking at those documents, particularly the bylaws, I say you know brevity is is not a bad thing. Yes. Oh wait. What's your thought on updating your bylaws, reviewing them periodically, and making amendments to it? We may have made amendments to ours but had not reviewed them in the 29 years. We just did that and eliminated things like meetings will be notified by telegraph. Right. <laughs> Excellent. And that was right at the advent of the telegraph. Um, 
it's it's important, and Jeff, you may um, chime in here, but it's it's very important to regularly review them. I, we do have clients that I think go overboard that do it once a year, for instance. There's a, you know they they feel as though there's something wrong if they don't have a bylaws uh, amendment before the membership in the the coming annual meeting. Um, you know I, I think some some shoot for you know maybe three four year review cycle. Um, obviously, pay attention. There will be. Uh, events that trigger a, ne uh, you know, a necessary review. You know, states change their corporation statutes pretty regularly. Jeff just sort of rattled off two or three at the beginning of the, of the program. Um, and, you know, it's important to, to you know, work with your counsel to understand when that happens, and that's um, definitely a reason to do it. Yeah, it, it, it's very important to do it and recognize that bylaw reviews, it's one of those areas where kind of what I alluded to at the outset, this whole area generally, it's a combination of legal and non-legal issues. And bylaws are the principal kind of governance framework for your nonprofit organization. How do we govern ourselves and how do we elect or appoint the people that are going to govern us, govern us et cetera? And what's, if you have members, what's the role of the board versus members, all these sorts of things, the role of committees, uh, what committees do we have, how do the committee members members get appointed, how long do they serve, all this kind of good stuff. Um, of course, like George mentioned at the outset, the bylaws have to be consistent with your Articles of Incorporation and, most importantly, with your the state nonprofit corporation statute where you're incorporated. And especially when states like most recently New York and D.C. and Illinois overhaul their statutes, you have to review your bylaws to ensure compliance with the revisions to those statutes. It goes without saying. But at the same time, uh, what I've seen over the years is that bylaw reviews and overhauls can be most effective also in helping to make sure that the organization is being governed most efficiently and effectively. You don't want bylaws to get in the way of effective governance of your organization, but we've seen it, we've all seen it too many times when, when they do. And if that's the case, then you want to push for simplifying them or taking away certain requirements or procedures, uh, providing maybe more flexibility to the board, more deference to the board, maybe more authority to the executive committee if you have a very big and unwieldy board, maybe reducing the size of your board, maybe reducing the number of committees or in reducing the number of steps that are required to approve certain things, taking certain power away from the membership or away from a house of delegates if you have that, like some organizations do. These are all things that really aren't legal issues, but they are important in making your, your bylaws more efficient and effective. And for those of you here in the room, in your handout book, there's an article that our colleague Kristen Lawson and I wrote uh, about a year or so ago called The 15 Most Common Nonprofit Bylaw Pitfalls, How to Avoid the Traps. And for those of you on the phone, it will be included in materials that you get emailed tomorrow. I would strongly encourage you to take a look at that article. It was one we, we kind of wrote after a, a, a webinar that, that we did on the subject, and it really touches on what, what, what we think are the 15 most common areas, pitfalls that, that nonprofits tend to fall into in, in the bylaws area. So I, I think a very important point that, that both George and, and Jeff made is, uh, and, and the word I would use to synthesize it all is minimalist. And the, the last rewrite that we did, we, we went minimal. So very basic things, like for example, in the past we had had the board will have X number of members. Uh, the, the rewrite is the board will have at least X number, which I think is three, a very small number that gives us a great deal of flexibility to go anywhere we want. Uh, the board will meet at least once a year, instead of saying the board will meet four times a year. Now we still meet four times a year, but we have the flexibility, if needed, not to do that. And we haven't needed to exercise that or use that flexibility yet, but that can become uh, very important if there's a reason why you don't really think a meeting would be the best thing to do at a certain time. Uh, and if it's very clearly stated that you're okay doing that, then you're okay doing that. So I think the, the minimalist idea of the bylaws and then the policies, whether they're the guiding principles that we talked about earlier, can go, are layered on top of that, uh, but the bylaws underline everything, uh, but, but, in, but in a way that, that allows the maximum amount of flexibility, again, so the organization can best serve the mission. And Mike, I, and by the way, there's a question up here, Marion. I'm, I'm personally a, a, a big fan of minimalist bylaws and minimalist policies and procedures, but what we've seen in some organizations is that it's usually because there is maybe some history of mistrust of the board, maybe some abuse that occurred, um, and maybe it's just a cultural issue. You know, we see it a lot different professions that you know have different approaches to their industry associations. Some are very micromanaging, some are more deferential to the board. Um, 
But in some organizations, unfortunately, that just doesn't work, or at least not for this period of time. But as you were talking about, organizations evolve. So you might have a real restrictive set of bylaws and policies and procedures coming off a time where you had all sorts of abuse and poor performance and other, you know, uh, just really bad board performance. But then maybe five, six, seven years later, the, the organization is maturing, the board is maturing, and you don't need that, and you can do what you did and, and make the bylaws more minimal. Sort of like the control board for the District of Columbia, right? <laughs> I think ultimately it comes down to, or one of the things it could come down to is, are we looking for governance for governance sake? Or are we looking for good governance for the mission's sake? And, and, and that's, that goes back to the relationship with the, the board and, and the staff have. And if we're all in this together, we can honestly say that we need to create the best form of governance for the, to suit the mission, then we should be able to find that. I think we have a... Wait, one more and we're going to... Yeah, last question, then we're going to move on to the next one. So Laura? We've been talking a lot about changing bylaws and reviewing bylaws. What about articles of incorporation? Do you go back and review those and redo those, or are those that, that whenever we create more implications with the state? Certainly. When it, whenever we, we do a bylaws review, the first thing we do is pull the articles of incorporation that are on file in the state. Ideally, the articles of incorporation are <clears throat> very minimalist and, and only say what, what's required to get recognition of exempt status and to get nonprofit corporate status and nothing more. So. I guess I can say usually. Um, usually there doesn't need to be an amendment to the Articles of Incorporation. But very often you'll find that whoever incorporated you may have said, for instance, there shall be 15 directors. And then 20 years later you, your bylaws say there shall be 21. Or, you know, so so there's, there's an inconsistency in this. That earlier slide about the hierarchy, when there's an inconsistency, it's the articles that control. And it's often a surprise to the organization. Yeah, and then probably the two most common areas where we end up uh, helping with uh, amendments to the Articles of Incorporation. One is if there's a name change, because you have to amend the articles if there's a name change. And just so you know, for those of you organizations with voting members, uh, every state statute that I can think of, state nonprofit corporate statute, requires a membership vote to amend the articles, whereas bylaws, it generally, it's up to the organization to decide who can amend bylaws. And the other would be the purposes clause. So uh, most Articles of Incorporation have a, a purposes clause, some generic, but most are tied to the specific purpose and mission of your organization. Uh, that is very important uh, from a number of perspectives, including an IRS perspective, including for, with respect to your tax exempt status. So if you want your purposes to be broadened or to change direction or to be narrowed or to do whatnot, you need to not only amend your, your bylaws, but your articles as well. Right. All right, let's move on to the... We're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> um, okay, the next one um, that I think is um, <clears throat> far more practical than legal, and, and perhaps one that Mike doesn't always follow: uh, <laughs> choose your battles. Um, and and you know, just, I just choose often. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it may, you know, it, it, the concept is is that that um, you know there there will be times. Look, the, the best practice, the ideal organization that that you probably heard before in, in relationship with the board is. The board sets the strategy and the mission in consultation with the staff, but the staff implements, you know, so um, very often in my perspective, we'll hear from staff saying, you know, the board is all in the weeds on this. It, they're, what they're talking about is not strategy and mission. What they're talking about is implementation, and that's our role. And, you know, some, you know, staff expect, you know, a, a lawyer to come in and say, well, well, that's wrong. You know, I, I'll step in and tell the board they can't do that. that. That's not correct. The board does run the show. And I, one example that I've given is, um, you know, if the board says the CEO's office shall be painted pink and they do a, they gavel it through with a vote, I mean, so be it. That's that's as as in the weeds as you can get. Um, but um, still, there should be a good understanding if you're working well with your board leaders. You, you've got an understanding that that. You know, this is the area where, where we'll sort of take charge. This is the area where, where, where you'll, you'll take charge and you'll obviously work together. But there will be times in the discussion at a board meeting when a director or even the chair may cross, cross that line. And, you know, my purely non-legal sort of practical advice is, you know, that's not always a time to step in. I mean, I think you, and, and if you do feel that someone's crossed the line too much uh, and, and, and need to say something, do it in a way that's tactical or, or, and, and it doesn't embarrass anyone It's you know, after the meeting and after the break. So I, I think th this does go back to one of the earlier ones or several of the earlier points we talked about. Uh, probably most importantly, the relationship between the, the chief executive and the board chair uh, and having a strong 
board chair. It, 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 when, when something like that happens, or even hopefully something like that would never happen, and it didn't, that at least didn't happen to us. But uh, the, the chair should be, should be the one, I believe, okay. stepping in when the board, legally or not, is, is overstepping its bounds and is moving away from the oversight strategy, and again, we can talk about that, um, to implementation practice running, running the day-to-day -day operations of the organization. When, if, if you're in a situation like that to begin with, if I as a chief executive reacted strongly against that, chances are really, really good the situation would only get a lot worse and get a lot worse fast. Uh, so that's when you need the chair and, and these pre-meetings, if you will, this, this understanding uh, between the executive and the chair to say, look, folks, th this is not our business. You know, our, our, one of our, uh, I believe one of the most important jobs a board can do is hiring, reviewing, supporting, and if necessary, firing the chief executive. And if, if a board does a good job of doing that, they shouldn't need to. They shouldn't feel as if they need to get too deep into the weeds. And if they feel that they do, then chances are either there's something really wrong with the board or there's something really wrong with the chief executive and that chief executive needs to go. Uh, so I, I, this is, George and I have this discussion often uh, about the, the whole strategy piece. Um, I recognize that that's sort of accepted parlance that the board oversees the strategy and direction of the organization. I'm, I'm not a, I, I don't buy into that 100%, honestly. Uh, I, I think the board, uh, a, a big responsibility of the board is to make sure that the organization doesn't go outside of its mission and strategy, uh, that it doesn't you know, in, involve itself in mission creep. And that's, that's an important check. And I think especially if you've been at an organization for a while uh, and you're, you're deeply invested in what's going on, you could tend to look a little too far outside the lines, and that outside check is, is, is important. And when discussing strategy, I think board input is, is vital and that they, the board will often offer perspectives that staff may not have considered. And that's incredibly important to come up ultimately with the good strategy. But I just don't believe honestly, that, that even an involved board member, uh, a very engaged board member, uh, would have a better handle on strategy than a group of paid professionals who are deeply invested in this mission um, to, to design strategy. I just, I simply just don't. Or, or Mike, maybe the other way to put it, uh, and I don't disagree with you, but um, I would view it more as, yeah, we definitely all agree that a board's role should not drill down into micromanagement. We all agree. It needs to kind of stay up here, and there is a very important and valuable role that the board can play. I would tend to agree with you, though, that when it comes to things like strategic planning, that it's not solely the board's function, and that in, in the, the hundreds and hundreds of organizations, nonprofit organizations that we work with each year, the ones that have really good, talented, sophisticated staff, the ones that have been there for a while, they're going to be most likely in the best position to suggest new directions and strategy, you know, new avenues, new opportunities, new revenue sources, you know, new endeavors, activities, programs, et cetera. And for the board to try to do that, engage in that process without the senior staff right. would, would seem foolish. Right. And, and it, 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 it's all based, again, on that relationship and that communication. If that trust exists, certainly that's the way it's, it's going to go. Uh, but, but sometimes when it's set up so black and white that the board is in charge of strategy, I, I think we need to, as Jeff, because of his legal background and counseling, uh, is able to say a little, a little better than I, uh, that, that, it, uh, that it has to be that relationship is, is what I'm getting at. And, and it can't become confrontational, and that's, again, when you're just going to end up in a lot, a lot of problems. Just a, a little footnote to the, the idea that the board has the ultimate authority to <clears throat> take whatever action it chooses. Boards can and do very frequently contract away some of that authority with their CEO agreements where they may agree uh, that the executive's uh, purview will be the hiring and firing of staff underneath the executive and that the board's um, sort of sole staff oversight is with the, the CEO. So that can be an exception to that general rule. All right, so uh, choose your battles, but uh, the flip side of that is don't tolerate abuses. And, and you have to be con conscious and, and, and aware of 
when a sort of maybe a style difference or you know a little heavy handedness actually veers into things like conflicts of interest, um, you know, abuse of authority, you know, attempting to use the director position for favors, um, you know, to um, uh, you know get in the in the front of the line of, of you know benefits that the organization offers and those sorts of things. Um, you know, a good conflict of interest policy is going to address that, and um, a strong relationship with the, the, the board chair will will help very much to um, you know. Hopefully, you know, either stop those um, abuses from from happening, or at least stem them from from growing into to bigger problems in the future. Um, you know, one of the concepts that that comes up very often, legal and non-legal, is who has the authority to speak on behalf of the organization. And we talked earlier about the individual director as a director has no individual authority to bind the organization, but that doesn't stop individuals sometimes from presuming to maybe be interviewed by uh, a trade press or to uh, give a statement or even to, you know, even to endeavor to sign an agreement on behalf of the organization. So um, good training, good policies in place should, should, for the most part, control that, but sometimes egos may get in the way. Right. And, I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say there's a, a doctrine called the apparent authority doctrine that uh, the Supreme Court hammered home in a 1985 case involving a nonprofit that makes clear that if an outside third party would reasonably believe that the person who is attempting to exercise authority on behalf of the nonprofit organization has, it does indeed have that authority. If it's reasonably apparent to them, then the organization is going to be bound by that action. And we see it all the time, especially in smaller, less sophisticated organizations where you know, a volunteer is signing a contract for a meeting space or, or for a consultant contract, vendor contract. Um, and it's, that's why the Supreme Court made clear it's very important for nonprofits to have good, strict rules in place as to who has the authority to act on behalf of the organization. And, and things like letterhead, access to letterhead, or you know, sometimes board members want business cards and that sort of thing. We really sort of caution against you know, sort of letting those be freely available. So, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the time, too, so I, I don't want to go too deep into this one. I, I should also say at this point that I love my board. Uh, no one get the wrong idea, please. And that, that we've uh, hearty discourse is always a good thing. Uh, but I, I do think this the, the tolerated abuses an important point to highlight here is is again the strong chair, and the chair needs to be able to recognize this, have the relationship with the individual directors to say, look, this you're, you're not pulling your weight, or this is not the right thing to do. Uh, some of this we did see a situation when I, I felt that the there were some directors are. And I, and I think this is, this is possible, and I've seen this in other organizations too, so this isn't just us, but when board service can become more about the board member than the organization. Uh, we, we often talk at DC Central Kitchen, we've tried to flip the charity model to move away from this idea of the, the redemption of the giver and more towards the liberation of the receiver. And I, and I want to look at our board the same way, that the board service is not about the directors. It's about what the directors can do to support the organization uh, and the mission. And that doesn't mis necessarily mean supporting me or, or making me right. It means what's doing right for the organization. And when some of these abuses start happening, it takes away from the, it takes away resources, it takes away time, it takes away energy from supporting the mission of the organization. Yeah. I, I've noticed that the advent of um, cell phones with texting um, seen in some boardrooms where some buddies pair up and actually start texting one another, you know, as the meeting's going on. And it's uh, just one of the examples of some of those splinter groups and the, 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 the sort of side groups you try to really get that board chair to, to, mm -hmm. to get um, out of the way. Yeah, and, and like Mike was alluding to earlier, cannot underestimate or, uh, or stress enough the importance of kind of laying the groundwork politically in advance. You know, a good CEO is going to know what the hot button issues are going to be coming up at the board meetings. They're going to know who's on what sides of those issues if it's something controversial. Um, and the CEO and the board chair really need to work together in advance to, if not solve anything, I just, it was involved at a, a client board meeting a couple months ago um, where there was a very controversial issue. And I thought the CEO and the board chair did a great job in advance of talking to all the key parties, figuring out where the lines are going to be drawn, helping to be sure everyone had all the relevant facts, and making sure that the questions and the debate was framed properly so that when it did occur, it was very civil. It was a very heated issue, but very civil, and everyone was on the same page, and they were able to make a more informed decision. It was a, a split vote, but at least the, the process worked a lot better than it probably would have otherwise. 
Okay, the next one that uh, we've identified is put directors in the best position to do their jobs. Um, it, it, you know, from a legal perspective, this really helps the board members fulfill their fiduciary duty of care. If the materials are clear, provided well in advance, detailed enough to give a good picture of the organization, um, you know, using things like uh, um, dashboards and graphs and, and visual, um, you know, things to break up the monotony of the, the, the particularly the financial information that's, that's being presented, helps uh, to to a great degree of letting the board members focus on what's really, you know, one of their key things is oversight of the financial health of the organization. Um, you know, it sounds you know, straightforward and, and, and simple enough, but, um, you know, having gotten materials for numerous board meetings um, over the course of my career, I can tell you that m many organizations don't, don't do a good job of making that clear. Yeah, so we, we th this is really important. This is very important, um, uh, but also very difficult. I, I've, I've sat on boards when I've said this. I've heard other directors say it on boards that I've run is we want to be more engaged. Uh, but ask them what that means that it's harder to get the next answer uh, it's it's really hard again because people are not exactly sure what their board service means and what they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to do it so again setting these expectations but absolutely providing all the information you can and seeking out we, we've changed our board uh, report uh, format uh, we've changed what documents we're sharing We've moved uh, to a, a, a almost entirely a dashboard situation for a, for a good number of the, the programmatic financial and development uh, topics that we discuss uh, in response to what the board has said. Uh, but always, always with the goal of being incredibly transparent. I think that that's, again, that goes back to the heads up. It's not letting anyone be surprised, anyone being caught off guard. This is exactly where we are. Uh, again, you want to think of this as if you're in this boat together and it's going down, you're going down together. Uh, and if everyone has the more, more information everyone has, the better off you're going to be and you're going to avoid that, that calamity uh, hopefully in the future. So the, the dispersal of information there is, is yeah. absolutely key. And when we talk about meeting the fiduciary duty of care, you know, when there have been those rare instances where individual directors have been successfully uh, challenged for breaching that duty, invariably it's because of financial calamity with the organization. Something happened with the resources of the organization, be it through embezzlement, through just um, um, bad investments, uh, through you know other sorts of waste of, of charitable assets. So when I'm talking about this information making clear, it's most important in the financial realm. And, and for those of you in the room and on the phone who are, who are the chief staff executives of your organization, I'm thinking about um, probably about a half dozen clients just in the last couple years uh, whose CEOs are no longer there, uh, they were let go, all related to uh, financial improprieties, um, uh, improper procurement, uh, embezzlement, um, uh, not disclosing key financial information to the board that ended up being incredibly problematic and losing the organization a ton of money. And the key theme in all of these cases is not only that there were uh, financial irregularities, but that there was a lack of board disclosure. In fact, in, in one of the cases, uh, just the other day, I was speaking to the immediate past chair of the board who was uh, reminding me of when he first came into office and was asking the, the CFO for copies of the monthly financial statements, and the CFO told him, well, that's a highly unusual request. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, it's not the culture of the organization to disclose even basic financial information to the board. And needless to say, that CFO and CEO are no longer employed by the organization. But uh, it, it, it's become a best practice, of course. But it's just amazing to me you know, how much this continues to occur and how many CEOs continue to, continue to lose their jobs because of it. The other points put in here to answer the question about strategic planning, I, I think it's, it's incumbent on staff to make sure that, that a regular cycle of strategic planning or whatever you want to call it so that the big picture can be sort of buffed up and repainted or whatever it might be over the course of a couple of years to make sure that um, everyone on board understands where the direction is that we're heading. I mean, if we're working with them to help do the strategy and mission, you know, they need to know where that is and, and what a clear picture of that is. Um, and, and so I think that that's part of needs to be built in as much as it can be a hassle. It's sort of it, it's a bit um, um, sort of up in the clouds as opposed to, you know, handling the day to day that that shouldn't be ignored. 
And, and the other point I would just say is, um, again, more an art than a science, but you know, make sure that you have enough time for discussion on matters, um, particularly of importance, uh, at the board meeting and be available in calls and things like that. Um, very often uh, the, the desire in a meeting is to gavel it through and get to whatever's after the meeting, but particularly when it comes to financial discussions, you know, ample amount of time to, to, to talk is very important. All right, so it's a baseball, little, little baseball reference here. Tend to the farm system. Um, you know, many organizations, um, um, I think, ignore or, or don't pay as, as close attention as they can to um, developing leadership from, from the grassroots. And, um, you know, there, there's a tremendous structure, trade associations, professional societies, nonprofit social, social service organizations. Everyone has some form of, opportunity for participation as a volunteer below the board level um, and and that's that's where people prove themselves um, you know I, I very often I'm sure you've seen it but very often you get people who are sort of gunning for the board um, who um, don't kind of go through the steps and don't go through the, the point of, of sort of showing their 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 worth and if you don't have a strong process in place like a nominating committee policy or some other form of document that says here are the things we will weigh you know give great weight to when considering who to nominate on the slate these people who if they're you know sort of pushy enough or they know the right people they make it on the board and, and turn out to be you know perhaps not not the best decision and and so, so why not use what's there for you to to really develop a good talent system one of the things that, that we do, our, a key piece when, when, when we're considering board members is we're really only looking for people who in some way have been associated with our organization in the past. Uh, whether they're, a, a, it could be a longtime donor, we really haven't gone down that road, a volunteer, say a chef in the community who's been very engaged with us, a member of a, a company that supported us over the years. So we, again, this, I, I say this word a lot, but it's very important, the mission. We're not interested in just having board members for, because they want, to, they want to be on a board. And we've had people come to us and say, hey, we, we have someone that we'd like to get on your board. Why? Well, because they want to be on a board. Well, that doesn't seem good enough to me. Uh, there should be, uh, just, just as we, hi again, as we hire staff, we want people, we can train people to do a lot of things. We can't train them to be uh, passionate about the work that we do. And I think that good board members need to have that same kind of passion. All right. So tip number eight, um, make it worth their while. Um, you know, it, it, we don't pay board members for our organizations, um, and we, we don't want individuals on our board who are strictly there for the recognition or a resume, just as, as you know, Mike pointed out. We want people who are as committed to, admit, to the mission as possible. Um, but there should be some recognition for the fact that there's a tremendous amount of time that's required of these directors and a tremendous amount of responsibility placed upon them. There is this risk of personal uh, liability. Um, you know, we're always concerned from a legal end that, that there not be improper benefits be given to board members, um, you know, things like uh, um, uh, you know, excessive gifts or, you know, uh, you know, payments that weren't sort of part of the ex expected um, uh, service. Um, there, there can be risks on that front from a tax exemption perspective, whether you're a 501c3 or a 501c6. Um, but, but there are sort of soft benefits that, that you can and should do to make the board members feel as though their contribution is, is valued. I mean, they may not say it, but I think everyone likes a little sort of public recognition of that fact, and, and there are ways to do that. Each of you have, I'm sure, very prominent, you know, be they annual meetings, fundraising events, and those sorts of things. You know, bring your, bring your board members up, bring your, your, your elected leaders up to, um, you know, have a visible presence on that and make sure that, that they understand that, um, you know, they're, they're valued. And, you know, sometimes it could even be, you know, letters of recognition, plaques, all these things that seem, you know, um, uh, like, you know, old hat is, is, you know, still valued by people who are giving of their time. Absolutely. It does sound a little hokey, but we've actually created an agenda item on our quarterly board meeting that's board kudos. And it's part of the PowerPoint. And we list, go through, and identify what board members have done over the previous quarter that has been helpful to the kitchen, whether it's bringing new folks down, whether it's coming to volunteer, attending one of our events, uh, putting us together with another group or a foundation, anything and, and with pictures and, and really almost make it competitive, right? There's, there's always the, 
the, uh, the, the hidden agenda here, but it's interesting to see people like to see their name on that slide. They want to know that – they want their colleagues to know that they're doing this, and this is important. Again, it, it's hard for uh, staff – to continue to ask board members to be involved in this way or another. You know, again, engagement. What can we possibly do to continue to engage you? It really, this, this peer uh, suggestion from other board members say, hey, look, this is what I did. You, you can do that too. So we, again, we, we have it as a regular agenda item now that people come to expect and want to see that they're recognized for what they, the contributions they've made. And of course, we do have um, some clients on maybe the other end of that spectrum. Um, in fact, we had one within the last year that wanted to compensate their board members so much that we had to go out and hire one of the top compensation consultants uh, to try to get comparables to justify the compensation that they wanted to pay. Which, by the way, we couldn't do. <laughs> because uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of zeros in that. Yeah, so it, it, that it, average exactly. Is not most, good. Nonprofit, <laughs> most nonprofits don't compensate their board members. Some do. It is permissible as long as the compensation is reasonable. What is more common, of course, is to, is to provide perks and benefits, to, to have meetings in nice locations, to pay for, for travel, provide nice meals. We have some clients that pay for, for spouse and companion travel. Uh, to board meetings and, and committee meetings and things like that. Uh, you know, all of these are permissible. You always have to be mindful of uh, the private endearment doctrine, uh, which George alluded to, which applies to C3s, 4s, 6s, et cetera. But, um, you know, uh, bottom line, uh, you, you absolutely need to make these bo uh, board members make it worth a while because you are asking a lot of them. And if you want to attract and retain good people, uh, you need to make it worth a while. All right, uh, nine. Um, this is the most important one. <laughs> so um, this is uh, uh, something that, that I'm sure you've noticed. I've noticed in sitting in many boardrooms, different organizations from time to time. Um, there is this tremendous disparity among those who speak all the time and those who sort of quietly hide in the corner and don't, don't speak much. And, and I think that tremendously sort of deludes dilutes the, 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 the whole value, the whole idea that a board is supposed to deliberate, a board is supposed to make decisions based on, you know, good interaction. Um, so um, one of the things that, you know, in talking with chief staff uh, executives of, of our clients and others, um, you know, one of the, the, the the solutions that they've hit upon that I thought have been successful is really work with the board chair to just, you know, make a conscious effort every meeting to call out the quiet ones and, and sort of gently uh, remind or, 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 you know, move forward from those who, who tend to, you know, want to talk on every point. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, difficult in practice, but important to keep at and to keep trying to get the full value of what your board is all about. And I think it helps even the introverts who may not like being called on at first, um, they start to see the value of their presence. And, and you know, a lot of times if, if you're a quiet person, you may have something in your head that you want to volunteer, but you're waiting for the exact perfect moment to do it. And what the chair can do is provide you with that perfect moment. So um, also in the, in the interest of, of equity, uh, and as the, as the board is supposed to hold the staff responsible and uh, accountable to goals, and one of the reasons, again, we've created these dashboards is so that there's an easy way to do that. We've created a, a board dashboard, uh, which I, I ripped off from a, a board I was on several years ago. Uh, we called it there the board report card, and we've taken uh, the, the, the pieces from the guiding principles document that we've asked the board to do, and we've put it on a spreadsheet along with the dates of all the meetings and committee meetings and events that we have, and if you attend and participate and make your annual contribution and do these other things, you get a little check mark. So you're going to get actually a written report card dashboard on, on your participation. Uh, so far, the way we did this in the, the other organization that I was involved with, it was private for two meetings, and then it's, it's now published as part of the board report. So every board member is aware of what other people are doing. It, it doesn't have a, a, a dollar value on a contribution, but if you've made it, how many meetings have you attended? Have you done these other, have you committed, this one was a, an association, so have you contributed to a PAC, the PAC? Uh, and, I, and I think that's, that's fair. Uh, but again, the follow-up is the important piece. So then what happens with that? Is that a document that, that just exists for the sake of existing, or what we're going to do actually for the first time this year before, um, between now and April, before we go into our next board cycle, the governance committee 
will be meeting with each individual director and going over that report card and saying, well, you know, it doesn't seem like you're really, this is working out for you now. And, and again, that's fine. Maybe the timing isn't right, other, whether it's work or family obligations, and again, that's fine. Uh, but, but asking the board member to consider uh, maybe not continuing to participate on the board if they're just not able to participate. There's really no reason to carry someone uh, to take that space if they're if it doesn't make them a bad person doesn't mean they can't support the organization just means that maybe now is not the right time so it has to i think creating the document that's actually black and white step one but the follow-up is ultimately what's going to be really important to make that work i agree i agree okay our, our last one is uh no surprises comma please uh, so, um, th this is um, important, obviously, to keep your leadership apprised of big news so they're not finding it out other, through other avenues. Um, it, um, it, I, I think to follow this point properly in a way to sort of, you know, manage your own or, or protect your own sort of authority over particular areas, Anything that you're reporting that might be news that you want to share with the chair or with, with, the, with the board um, should be couched with the resolution or, or the proposed resolution, um, if at all possible. Uh, I mean, you know, there are going to be eventualities to come on, you know, like a, a disaster at headquarters or something like that, where obviously you're going to just, you know, even though you may not have a resolution in place yet, you, you need to. Um, but when it comes to, for instance, a staff person leaving unexpectedly, um, you don't want to be in the position of, you know, a director or, or the board chair saying, well, the first I heard of it was some other staff person told me, why didn't you keep me apprised of it? Um, so even though it's your purview and even though it's not, you know, technically, you know, in the board's bucket, um, it's important, I think, to keep them apprised of these, of these developments as quickly as possible, but include and here's who we've got coming in to interview, and you know, we've, here's sort of the, the, the resolution plan going forward. So, so it can't be construed as you sort of putting it in the hands of the board or, or maybe inviting the board into something that isn't, isn't their area. But by the same token, you won't be accused of you know, sort of you know, hiding the ball on them. Um, you know, I've been in uh, situations where um, just that example I gave, uh, it was an executive session of a board meeting, uh, really it was an ex the exec was in the board meeting, just giving an update on different staff developments and said something to the effect of, you know, so-and-so is a problem, um, you know, we're not sure what to do with his performance, um, you know, thinking about, you know, potentially letting him go or something along those lines. Um, and then after the exec left, the, the, the executive session continued on and, and one of the board members um, said, you know, why is the CEO putting this on us? And the CEO really wasn't putting it on them, but didn't do a sort of a clearly articulated, this is what I'm doing, I'm just keeping you apprised, um, really sort of leaving it up in the air and sort of questionable suggests to the board that you're putting something in their hands. And so I really want to sort of get that nuance across that you, while you, you need to keep the board apprised of all developments that are of, you know, sort of a significant nature, you should do it in a way that protects your sort of authority over those areas. Right. I think this is very much a do unto others kind of situation. Is that I, I know I don't like to hear about things that are happening in our organization or from, from someone else or running into someone on the street and saying, hey, I, I heard that Paul's leaving next month. Wow, you look like an idiot, right? No one wants that, and you want to respect the chair. But also, uh, I, I, I try to take it even a little further with the committee chair. So if there are things that are coming up that may or may not involve the committee at some point in time, I think it's really important that that, that chair be aware of it. Uh, and again, if you want to look at it from a clearly Machiavellian or very Machiavellian standpoint, we, we're covered. You know, I had this conversation with the chair. I had this conversation with the, the programs committee chair. And we decided that we were going to discuss it, not at this meeting, but the meeting in July. That was the, the timing of it. And then you, you're, you're at a good place. Or if the chair or the program committee says, chair said, you know what, this is actually I'd really feel more comfortable if, if we discuss this at the next meeting. Let's agenda that. that that's fine. But at least you're, you're setting the table uh, and you're creating, again, just creating that, that, that a further level of trust that I think is vital to the performance of, of any organization. Yeah, the disclosure to uh, to volunteers is, is great CEO job protection without question, and, and that CYA is very much necessary and, and utilized uh, quite often. Uh, just one uh, comment on this. 
One thing we do see a lot, particularly in organizations with larger boards or in organizations where the executive committee is really the driving force from the, from the volunteer leadership perspective, which happens quite often and is not unhealthy in my experience, but there also needs, just like there has to be a good staff volunteer balance, uh, kind of balance of power, there has to be a good balance between staff, executive committee, and board of directors. And I have seen in some of our clients where the executive committee almost seems to have too much authority and is not sharing much at all with the board. I mean, it's really driving the ship and functioning as the board of directors. And from a legal perspective, it is the, you know, the executive committee members certainly owe a fiduciary duty, but so do the board members. And they can't exercise their fiduciary duty properly if they're really not in the loop on a lot of key things. So, you know, again, it's, it's, this evolves in organizations. It changes over time. Every organization is different. But if you are one of those organizations that has a kind of an, an omni-powerful executive committee and a board that seems to just be a rubber stamp, that's probably a red flag that that's a yeah. problem. I would just say, I mean, that, in terms of meeting your fiduciary duty of care, you know, that, that old euphemism that life is 90% showing up. Well, so is board service. I mean, you, you, you pick up what's going on with the organization because you're present, and, and it's, it should be the number one criteria for getting on a second term, for instance. Okay. We... Um, <laughs> And, and Mike, I, I told you we were going to get questions uh, asking for copies of your statement of guiding principles for board and staff. I know uh, you told me that George said you're not allowed to distribute it, but you were overruling George. I'll consult with counsel on that. <laughs> I'd be happy to. No, uh, we'll make sure that that's included and linked to the email that goes out to everyone tomorrow. I think it would be a useful document for uh, folks to use. Of course, it has to be tailored to your organization. If one of the things you have to learn from today's program is that every organization is different and evolves over time, but it's, uh, it's a great straw man to use as a, as a starting point. I want to thank uh, George and Mike for a terrific presentation. Thank you all for coming, and we hope to see you back here next month. Have a great Thanksgiving holiday, too.